The name of our uh, topic today is Vale, a global company in the Philippines. Vale is a diversified mining multinational corporation and one of the largest logistics operators in Brazil. In addition to being the second largest mining company in the world, Vale is also the largest producer of iron ore, pellets, and the second largest producer of nickel. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and join me to welcome our main speaker for today, the person you all came here to hear, Fernando Moya, Exploration Manager of Valley Philippines. Thanks, Leo, for... Oh, nice to see you again. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Very detailed, indeed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I hope you're all enjoying the uh, lunch. I believe there's still some room for more. So... So it's not a heavy meal. No, it's, uh, there's a lot of information, but I think it's going to go down smoothly and uh, going to be easy to digest. Uh, Kevin, congratulations for the event. I think it's a large crowd. It's a good kickoff. Um, uh, well, me too, you know, for the inaugural presentation. Uh, you know. And then I think was uh, I thought it was a great idea, you know. Vale is a well, it's a large, it's one of the major mining companies in the world that we are here for a few years. Um, nobody, I mean, not everybody know much about us. And uh, when they move here, you know, people are saying Vale, Vale. Uh, you got it right, Vale, not Vale. So Vale is a Brazilian mining company. And then uh, we are in probably more than 30 countries, about 21, 22 in exploration. And then today, what I want to do is, um, is an institutional presentation, right? I added a few more slides. The idea is to level, you know, the knowledge among yourselves and people so people can learn more about Valley. All right. So to start, just take a quick look at the company. The company was state-owned, okay, founded in, in 1942, so with a, a very high um, government influence. It started um, mainly with iron, had some gold mines, some aluminum, you know, but it was, was state-owned from nine, 1942 to 1997. You know, and the, the main business was iron ore, iron ore, iron ore. Uh, in 1997, uh, the company, now the government, the former president, Fernando, Fernando Henrique, uh, decided to privatize the company. It was an easy process. There's a lot of uh, concerns. So it was done, uh, and we were listed in uh, Sao Paulo Stock Exchange and New York Stock Exchange at a time. And last year, we, we just listed in uh, Hong Kong Stock Exchange. November, December last year. During this, uh, the, the privatization, privatization you know, it was a transition from a state-owned to a private company, so you can imagine how easy it can be, right? So I think we're still, you know, uh, improving a lot. There's a lot of, you know, uh, public, uh, like I said, public company mentality, but it's it's, it was a modernization process. You know, it is not easy for a large company. And about 2001, the company realized how, you know, how big it was in Brazil and uh, the potential it had. And, it, and they, the idea was, well, should we go overseas? Should we diversify? You know, we're going to take the risk. Otherwise, we're going to be taken over by someone. You know. And they decide to go overseas, cross the boundaries, and uh, invest. Of course, iron ore is the, the main business, so getting income, and then we can invest in other commodities. Um, during 2001 to 2010, was uh, accelerated growth, so 
It's a very aggressive target, you know, focus, focused on, a, on a profit and value creation. Um, we had a new organizational structure. I think I, I can tell like every year we had like two changes, you know. Still, we're still getting you now there um, with a better defined governance, focused on a strategic position to be a global mining, be one of the you know, large mining company. And we had to increase the portfolio, you know, to become a, a, one of the large mining company. You, you know, you need to deal with the multi commodities. And 2010, you know, we are you know, one of the best mining companies and the largest mining companies in the world. So, and uh, the idea is to continue, the strategy is to continue the implementation of the largest portfolio and to become the best and largest and most sustainable mining company in the world. So here's a snapshot, you know, where we were in uh, 1997. So we see a few countries, Brazil, US, who have a pretty much um, office there. Uh, only op operations only in Brazil, you know, the mine sites, exploration, logistics, everything. And you see in the, you know, in, the, in East Asia here, China and Japan, which were our clients. And, um, well, we also have some joint ventures with the Japanese companies on um, steel, steel plants in Brazil. This 1997, well, here's about 10,000, 11,000 employees, including third parties. 2011, we are now a global, a global company, definitely a global company with 120,000 employees, uh, including contractors and permanent, permanent third parties. Well, you can see here in South America, you know, you know, almost in all countries, with various offices. You know, the head office is in Brazil, is in Rio, and then we have uh, Carajás, probably. Most of you or some of you heard about Carajás. Carajás is a multi-commodity mineral province, you know, where the, one of the, the, the lar our largest uh, iron reserves are, about 20 billion, you know, reserves at 55, 60% iron. Yeah. So just for let you know, those who are into mining, our cutoff is about 55% in the, in the mines in Carajás. And it's uh, hematite, not magnetite. Um, but we are Argentina for potash and copper. Chile, definitely for copper. Peru, copper. Colombia, there's uh, recently bought a uh, coal mine and also lo looking for copper if there's any potential. Canada is mainly nickel and, and copper. Uh, US, um, copper, uranium. Uranium is not, no, not looking into. That, but I still have a project there, if I'm not mistaken. In Europe, you know, Norway, we have a, in France, we have refineries, and but we have a commercial office in UK. Um, Africa, mostly exploration projects. We just got into a huge project in uh, Guinea, Liberia, in, uh, in Guinea. Now it's uh, iron. Some people said that we found another carriages over there. Um, we are in DRC in Zambia, obviously for, for copper. Mozambique, coal operation, so uh, I mean, commissioning, going to start soon. It's a large, it's the first uh, ever coal project developed, developed you know, from exploration to, to operation. Then we have some countries in uh, what we call Eurasia for us, so Kazakhstan, Oman, where we are for uh, nickel, mainly nickel, nickel sulfides, and Kazakhstan copper. India is in between, so I think it's in our division, it's with Eurasia. And then in the Southeast Asia or Australasia, we have Mongolia, China. Uh, Japan, Korea, Thailand, Indonesia, Australia, yeah. where we have uh, commercial offices, exploration offices, and mines only in Australia, coal mines. So yeah, it was really fast growth, you know, and significant shareholder value creation. 
consolidated our position as the second largest mining company today. So if you see the market cap in 1997, and that was about seven four billion. This was when we when we were privatized. Okay, you see Rio Tinto with a twenty something you know, billion dollars cap. BHP, Anglo, you know, the three three majors at that time. And, and it's interesting to see the graph is you know the the bars here are aligned, but it's hundred times bigger. So for thirty billion, we're talking about three hundred billion here. BHP you now joint merged with the bulletin and it's still the first and a very you know solid uh, company and the valley by March 23 this year market cap was 165 billion dollars okay we already reached 180 billion but we've never been the the, first, the largest company it was just before the crisis I think it was about 180 billion and uh, followed by Rio Tinto, Extrata, Anglo American, and so it's all the large, very uh, large companies. So since 2001 to now, we can have an idea about how strong was their performance. Now, in terms of revenue, from four billion dollars in revenue ten years ago to 46, it's a record in the history of the mining industry. So. 2010 was an unbelievable year. You know, Val achieved best ever annual result, uh, characterized by the all-time high figures for operating revenues, uh, operating income, margin, cash generation, net earnings. And uh, to have an idea about the breakdown to different business. So iron ore, of course, is the major you now, rep representing about 57% of our business in terms of revenue. Nickel, 88.3%. Fertilizers, you now it's quite a new business for the company and we're doing quite well and investing a lot in fertilizers. Copper, small, but uh, it's where, uh, that's the commodity we're really looking into. Logistics, Val is now it's, um, 3%. Vale is a major, um, is, the, is the largest logistic company in Brazil, like uh, Leo mentioned. Coal, you know, is also part of our strategy. And others would include um, aluminum, manganese, uh, steel making, uh, and other, other business. Okay, so the outstanding production in 2010 that I just mentioned. Um, basically, we have increased the iron ore production in 30% from uh, 2009 to 2010. Nickel, interestingly, we reduced. I believe it's still a, um, um, let's say, a, a, ref a reflex of the, the financial crisis, and the nickel price just collapsed. Stockpiles were pretty high, so I think the production was uh, lower. But uh, now, with the nickel price is back on $27,000 per ton. Yeah, and then increasing the, the demand increasing. I think uh, I believe 2011 we're gonna we're gonna have a, a increase on that. Copper still a small business for the company, but has also increased. We have uh, basically one mine in Brazil, Sosego Mine, with 250 million uh, tons at one percent plus, and as operating uh, operation in Chile and coal. Also, a new area, rel relatively new area for us, but we continue to expand and uh, increase the production. So, numbers are not so high, but the increase was about 27 percent. Here's just you know, a photo of Carajas um, mine. It's not only one mine; it's about you now seven pits. You now they they are connected. You know, that's the whole operation. See, this is in the Amazon in Brazil. For your idea, this. Yeah. This is one one K. Increasing in terms of investment, uh, well, <laughs> this histogram can show like uh, in the last six years about eighty billion dollars invested. Now this includes in including uh, ac acquisitions. So it, here in two thousand six, that's when we acquired uh, Inco, uh, the Canadian. The international nickel company is a Canadian company. It was a great deal. It was a very it was a perfect timing. 
and then Vale you now became the second largest mining company. Uh, but uh, basically, then of course, 2007 reduced a bit, and then we are back on 2010 with uh, about 20 billion dollars invested. Now this includes acquisition, projects, um, uh, support to you know, to continue our operations, expansions. So for 2011, the budget approved you know, was. 24 billion investment. So, and then by category, it's about 81 percent, 80 percent on the organic growth, which are projects, you no know, exploration, advanced exploration, feasibility. Uh, also, may include some small acquisitions in that in that part, uh, right? And uh, eight eight percent on uh, research and development. Okay, so. Pardon. The projects here doesn't include exploration. The exploration is on the R&D, you know, the explorations and, and technology. The projects here, 73 percent, is basically to expand the operations and continue. And 18 um, percent is now just to keep the, the operations running. If you go by area, 42 percent of our bulk materials, so mainly iron and, and coal, as are the, the investments. Logistics, about 20% we're going to invest. We're building 12, what we call China Max. It's huge vessels for 400,000 tons. And we also, well, I just, well, being in the Philippines, we're quite far from Brazil. Sometimes I read a newspaper before the, the news comes through email. So there's a new um, port facility to be built in uh, Malaysia. It's going to cost about four four billion dollars. Yeah. Base metals, you know, include nickel and and, and and copper. So we are really hungry for that. Fertilizer is a great business. Um, I mean, the the income on the revenue is always not so high, but the profit, the margin you get in, in fertilizer is huge. It's much is a much better business than than copper, for for instance, and. Um, Fertilizers now is basically for agriculture. You know, with a population of six billion people, we need to feed them. So that's a strategy of that. Power generation, mainly in Brazil, but we're going to expand that in other business. Okay, so Vale is one of the largest mining companies in the world. Okay, with the, based on the um, Financial Times, you know, the, F, the FT 500 ranking. So we've seen 2002, we're about we are privatized, but no, starting, no, still, well, we are still crawling in, a, in the international scenario. But 2002, we just started living in Brazil, number 44, 446, and come 2003, 4, going up, you know. By 2006, when we took over Inco, we were 117 in the world, and then just kept growing, growing, and by, well, end of last month, I just announced that we are number 18th. Our strategy, as I mentioned, of course, was to leave, leave Brazil, become a multinational company, but also diversify the portfolio. Now, okay, from now on, that's the, the, the main business we have. So iron ore, you know, the idea is to um, expand the operations in Brazil implement the, the, the deposits in uh, in Africa, uh, the, the operations in Africa. Logistics, still expand you know, internally, and also building the vessels and, uh, and um, port facilities uh, around the world so we can deliver the, the, the iron and we have our own distribution centers. Nickel, well, we want to be the largest nickel player so we are expanding Canada. We have a, uh, a world-class deposit in, in Goro, New Caledonia. It's uh, under construction. I think a few months, I believe, in this year. We're going to start in production. It's about um, 60,000 tons per year of copper, metric tons of, cop of uh, nickel, and about 5,000 tons, metric tons of cobalt. Fertilizers, and I mentioned it's 
Vale is really interested about that. Made some acquisitions last year, and uh, we are doing a lot of exploration in, uh, in in expanding the plants on fertilizers. Coal is also a, a, a key uh, business for us. So we can, uh, for example, we as you see, we were our iron ore mining company, you know, and then you just provide iron ore for your clients. Let's say China, uh, Japan, Korea. But why not? To make it steel, we need iron, you need manganese, you need nickel, we need coal. So why not provide everything? So it's linked to that idea. Copper, we we have our uh, <laughs> our main. Um, I would say our main wish. You know, uh, we really want to get into copper. So that's why we're here in the Philippines. Right? So we have a lot of projects in, in copper. There are two large projects in copper in Brazil under construction, but um, in uh, Chile it's hard to get in, uh, Peru, so Africa, Africa sounds, it's, it's, uh, the projects are doing quite well. Steel making, this is one of the wish of the government, uh, and also, well, ours, you know, to invest more in Brazil. Actually, you know, to not only sell war to the others, but to invest in the industry in Brazil. So there are uh, several uh, steel plants, you know, JVs with Japanese companies or Korean companies or even with Brazilian company investing in that. In, in energy, well, Vale has its own um, hydro plants in Brazil just to you know to provide its own uh, power. And uh, energy is uh, going to be always, always going to be an issue. So we need to expand and, uh, and make sure you have energy. So if break down the guidelines for each business. So basically, the iron ore is to maintain our leadership, you know, in the global iron market, and create additional demand. Of course, because we have a lot of resources, we want to expand. So we need to cre create additional demand, uh, attracting steel partners to invest in Brazil. That's one of the strategies and then enhance our logistics capacity. For nickel, we want to be number one. So we need to expand the, the, the plants, you know, implement some projects in Canada. Also, some nickel, world-class nickel and iron projects in Brazil. Copper, so developing our copper resources in Brazil. There are a few projects, you know, under, uh, two, two large projects under construction. But I also look in Chile, and there are some advanced projects in, uh, in Africa, Zambia and Congo. And of course, continued exploration in uh, rich countries. Coal is look for various opportunities to become uh, one of the larger players in this, this business. And uh, potash, the investing to become a larger producer of fertilizers you know, in order to benefit from rising global consumption. Energy to optimize our matrix and develop uh, energy projects to support the growth of our business. So we are also looking to um, um, power plants um, beside our operations, you know, in, um, in other countries. <clears throat> okay, in terms of corporate social responsibility, oh, you can see large numbers. So that's the investment in CSR, which includes, uh, of course, uh, social and uh, environment. You know, so the average 2000, 2007, 2009 is about 700 million. You know, so for each of these, these three years, and jumped to over a billion 2010, and 2011. You now the budget approved is about 1.2 billion dollars. Okay. This is, of course, intimate to uh, support operations. You know, uh, we have I don't know how many projects, so several projects in in, in construction, in uh, or being in, under commission. So, it's the bulk of the investment is. But in exploration, we also need to to invest. But you know, needs to be. Uh, proportional to the level of your your project. Now we don't people see this. Oh, gonna, gonna a lot of money. So of course it's your project. Imagine the projects in Brazil, Canada, that I just mentioned to you. Goro, 
Goro project, we're still doing a lot of um, social projects and environmental projects there. So Valley wants to build strong, you know, and with the open relation, you know, open relationship with the communities, and to su su succeed, you know, to celebrate and share the success by creating, creating jobs, you know, educating and investing in the communities. So some some examples, it's job creation and economic growth to the country, you know, with a commitment to employ and train local workforces, environmental um, conservation initiatives. They will see a few slides ahead, you know, some beautiful examples. Uh, all our minds are ISO 14001 certified. Social outreach programs, you know, Different projects you've seen in the photos here, you know, of course, about education, but also creation, creating um, business opportunities for local communities. Education, uh, education and cultural programs, and social investment activities. You know. Here's an example of the Gora project in New Caledonia. So the, the photo, like it's bottom bottom right, beautiful photo. It's a word, it's a um, word class nickel letter right deposit. Imagine the impact, you know, you know the, or not, not, I don't say the impact, but imagine, you know, yeah, it's the impact on the, 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 the people's lives, you know, the size of this project there, right? The small island. Um, um, and one of the concerns, so, well, of the, the community was about they, they were losing the the dialect or the language. Okay, so basically, you know, when you engage community from the very beginning, you start understanding their concerns. When you start doing exploration and uh, and, and construction and and, and, and and when you're going to start mining, and then this is on the top right, just a photo of the guy collecting some words from the the elders, you know, to understand. Uh, and to help the the, the people you know, to preserve and to promote the the, the so-called uh, Kanak 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 language, yeah. and this this initiative is an example of effective engagement with the local communities through the participation and expression of the, their cultural and and linguistic heritage. Here's another example in uh, Mozambique. You know, it's a, it's a coal project that I mentioned. We are um, uh, is under construction. I think it's, you know, it's going to start operation uh, this year. This is an example about resettlement. So we're talking about 1,300 families, about 6,500 people. Okay, so with a family income with less than $100 a month, you know, when the profile of the community, uh, the, 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 the people in the country is about 70% rural and 30% in the urban zones. So you can see on the top right you know, how are the houses before. That's some examples of the house that Valley was building for the community. In the center here in the bottom is the, um, the village still under construction. And on the left side, you know, the hospital, uh, the Mines Institute, and the orphanage. So this is just a few examples that you know. Still on social responsibility, uh, we find vital, you know, uh, early community engagement, to engage the community from the very beginning, so when you start exploring. So we do engage the communities near and around the, the projects we are since the exploration stage, so, so that we can understand, you know, the social dynamics and uh, the information they need and what are their concerns, we can educate and inform them what is exploration, what is mining. You know, it's, it's, oh, this is the main thing, actually. Living in the Philippines here for, you know, for two years and uh, uh, working, I've, I've, I've traveled quite a lot, went to the provinces, and, and you see this is one of the, you know, the, the, the major issues. You know? And then, of course, there are some other concerns and, and myths, you know, and, but to educate people, make them understand what is exploration, what's mine, okay, how are we going to impact them here in the exploration, you know, how are we going to affect them, you know, or how they can benefit from this uh, at this stage. 
you know, and we have to manage expectations. We need to manage expectations. The exploration project, you know, it's oh, mining is, is gambling, right? It's it's a risky business. So, we, and the companies uh, are willing to afford to invest a few million dollars to do exploration. But after two years, you now if you don't find what you like, what you want, just go away, right? So, you need to bring expectations down. And uh, we'll, we'll lay on a solid foundation of trust and mutual respect to build for on, a f um, on for a possible next phase of the project. So you need to have a solid institutional relationship, you know, starting with the, the, the LGUs, I mean, giving an example in the Philippines. And you know, we need to deal with the local, local government and Barangay Council. They need to understand what you're doing, you know. And of course, next step would be the people. Here, an example of the, our engagement. Uh, in, in, in Masbate, okay, so I think in about six months we probably reached more than four or five thousand people listening to us in six months in forty something barangays, forty three barangays, and this year from from yeah from December to February another project in Panay, about one thousand people have attended our our uh, talks presentations. On environment, you know, as a large company, you also need to uh, respect the environment and you know, have in, on our environmental responsibility. We we do recognize as an, as as a large company, as a mining company, our operations you now does affect the environment. You know, but to reduce our footprint, you know, we continue you know, looking for um, new ways uh, or alternatives to preserve the balance between human progress and the natural environment, and actively educate and train people for environmental uh, responsible action. So examples of, um, of um, environmental action. So of course, a responsible operation. Nowadays, you know, with technology, it, it is possible to have a large operation and have everything controlled. Okay. Uh, reforestation, definitely. Green powered transportation, for example, Valley, it's uh, use a lot of biomass fuel and it's locomotives in, uh, in Brazil, mm. and responsible waste management. This is uh, another example in southeast, uh, southeastern Brazil, the state of Espírito Santo, where we maintain a natural uh, reserve with approximately 220 square case, you now with a vast fauna and flora. Uh, various species, species. So since uh, since the reserve was created in 1970, 1970s, nine, 96 new plant species have been discovered. This is the Carajás mineral complex. Uh, so these are talking about Amazon, um, north nor in north northern Brazil, in the state of Pará, where Vale operates the the world's the world's largest open pit iron ore in the. And the company is helping to protect nearly 8,000 square kilometers of the native forest in, in five conservation units. Another shot, you know, protect the rainforest, it's part of the Carajás mining complex. I, I, people, people love to compare things with Belgium. Uh, I don't think it's fair, uh, but uh, uh, 1.3 billion hectares. Uh, but, uh, of course, Belgium is not a large country, small country, but you know, it's 1.3 million hectares is not small. Um, in this this particular pro this particular reserve, you know, it's about 2,000 uh, species of plant make up the flora. You know, it's about 22 hectares, 22,000 hectares in the area. You know, 20,000 species of insects. Spiders, mammals, you know, and birds. So, of course, there's um, we work together with uh, institutions, uh, universities. You know, there's a lot of research uh, uh, being developed in these areas maintained by Valley. Here's an interesting sequence of slides. Okay, so please uh, pay attention to this area here. You now. The yellow um, outline. This is the Carajás complex. That's what we call Carajás complex. This is a satellite image. This is a snapshot in 1975. So 
as I said, the Carajas Mineral Province or Carajas region you know, is one of the world's largest mining complex. Okay, so here all green is forest, red roads, blue rivers, the white lines are municipal boundaries, and here white is basically urban areas. 1975, folks. 78, 75, 78, uh, grow a little bit along the roads here, 85, 10 years later, okay, so of course growing from the roads towards southwest, 1990, 15 years later, you see how the the deforestation for urban zones or mainly farming. 20 years later, 1995, see all this pink, where's my mouse? All these pink areas, it's deforested, you know. Here, still intact. 1999, growing, 2004. So. Almost 30 years after, you know, the forest preserved by Vali within Carajas <coughs> remains intact. Um, and you can't even see the footprint of the mine. This is the area of Carajas, but the mine that you saw in that, that photo later with the 1K scale with seven huge pits, you know, you can't even see that. Here's some examples, you know. Um, well, if you see the, the, the photo on the right side before, like, you wouldn't even say that was a was a pit before, you know. But that's how re rehabilitation can work. Okay. So we see on the left, yeah, it's not a pleasant view, but it's a mining operation. This was taken in 2001. Three years afterwards, if you drive by, you wouldn't you wouldn't even mention. Here's another mine, so you know you can see what can happen to the mine at the end, at the closure. Nice other example of a gold mine on the top left. Of course, the mining operation, you know. Um, then the mine was finished on the on the bottom, on the top right. Of course, the water level just went up to the left. Start doing some uh, revegetation and. Uh, about four years later, you, know, you would drive by or go, and then you would, you would just think it was a natural lake. This is another example. Of course, there's no there's no water dead. So, and uh, and this photo was taken 2005. I don't have the other one. Um, well, you can see how better it can look like, and um, continue reforestation. Here is a, for a waste pile on the left doing the operation, and then on the top right and bottom after reforestation and rehabilitation. So yeah, Vale is a global leader regarding sustainability and climate change management. So do you know, as a result of all these initiatives, yeah, we, we we've been awarded, you know. Um, a lot of prizes from um, some um, Brazilian magazines and also international awards like uh, as a world leader among all mining companies in the climate change ranking of a Goldman Sachs GS Sustain Report. And also, we are proud to be top five of the most sustainable companies of the, base, the basic material sector. United, United Nation United Nation Global Compact. So in 2008, Sustainability Report recognized as a notable notable communi uh, communi communication on progress. This is um, sustainability reporting recognition in Valley, 2010. Also GRI, uh, awarded 2010 for our uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives. Logistics. Well, Valley, it's a uh, major Logistics operation uh, operator in Brazil is a, in logistics is an important uh, ingredient for the for our business now for Vale's success. 
In 2010, for instance, uh, we accounted for 12% of the total Brazilian exports. Uh, well, as a, uh, our goal is to transport 522 uh, million tons a year of mineral products by 2015. Uh, we have invested about $9 billion worldwide in the last six years in logistics. This year, as I mentioned before, $4 billion just in this port facility in Malaysia. And there's one more billion in expansions in, uh, in, in logistics, in port terminals um, in Brazil. We, we own uh, main ports in Brazil, you know, Tubarão. No, in southeast to to receive you no know, the 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 ore from the mining operations in, uh, in this, this this part of the country. Ponta da Madeira is in the northeast, is from Carajás mainly, and and uh, Guaíba Guaíba is not here, but is in the in the south. And then we participate in important economic sectors in Brazil that represent 40% of the gross of the GDP, 28% 20, of the logistic market in Brazil, 16% of the total cargo in the country, and 30% handled in Brazil ports. So globally, you know, um, well, again, investing in logistics. Um, so, so, so for the mine, from the mine to the port, everything is integrated in order to reduce costs. That's that's the main idea. So, in Mozambique, when you're going to operate uh, a coal mine, we are also investing, you know, runways and ports to transport uh, about 11, 11 million tons a year of production. In in Guinea, the, the the other project that I mentioned before with the iron ore, there's also railroads and ports facilities involved. In uh, Asia, distribution centers. You know, mainly to to supply China and uh, Japan, Korea, so we can we can transport our ore from Brazil to Southeast Asia, have a distribution to Malaysia in this case, have a distribution center, and then and then uh, sell it to to China. You know. The reason for that is like Vale is building these these large vessels with the four hundred thousand tons, and. Uh, not, not any port can accommodate these vessels. Okay, there's only two ports in the world, I guess. So we need to build a port to accommodate these vessels, and then you would put in small ships and and, and resell it. Um, and uh, in Brazil, invest more in railways and, and ports. So, and uh, in this case, Argentina. So Vale carrying out large investments in logistics has a concession to operate 700. 50 k's of railways, which links the potash mine in Mendoza. It's a recent mine, that, uh, a recent project that we acquired last year. So, just a quick look in the Philippines. What are we doing here? So, I came to the Philippines in the end of 2008. You know, we, had, uh, we had one project by then. So it's been two years. We have reviewed a lot of projects. And uh, at the moment, we have three exploration projects. So the first one uh, we, we, we got into is the Masbate uh, project. It's an uh, exploration option agreement with, uh, with GeoGrace. This was June 2008. It's a grassroots exploration you know, for copper gold. Uh, we did some initial, in Italy, you know, initial exploration uh, works. Um, we had to to put on a hold in 2009 due to budget constraints. Because in the end of the day, we also were hit by the financial crisis. And then, of course, we were fighting for the exploration permit. It was granted recently, and we are just resuming the activities there. Uh, then, in 2010, last year, there's an option agreement with uh, Royalco. This is a project in the North Benguet. Uh, 15K south of Mankayan, Lepanto. It's a target generation and you know, drilling project. You know. um, that's the, the you know, where we are now. And uh, exploration is ongoing. We have been drilling. We have two rigs there. And the Panay project is our own, well, 
was our own application, now it's our own EP in, uh, in Panay, this island in Visayas, in Iloilo province. So it's a grassroots exploration as well. Um, so this year, you know, I think we can uh, generate targets fairly quickly. So um, hopefully we'll be drilling this year too. So in the Philippines, you no know, Valley, uh, I can I can tell I can, I can say in behalf of the company that we are committed to social and environmental sustainability in all our, our activities here, you know, and to assess, you know, long-term investments in the country. <laughs> yeah, well, we we all know that we I think for this public here uh, that we need net we need resources we need raw materials, right? And um, but not at any cost. Nowadays, 2011, you know, for you to be a, uh, for you to mine, you need to be responsible. You know, and this is not, you know, this is serious. Okay, so this is this is serious. Uh, you cannot develop a, a large project without caring about the environment, without caring about the people. Even if you don't have a, a solid project, you know, even the banks not finance you. You know, so for you to develop a project, you need, you know, you need for, of course, you need the resources. You need to find the resources. You need to, to have the money to develop and get the technology. But you need to work on the social side and look, at, look after the environment. Okay, so just to finalize this, the message, uh, the message I want to pass, which is also the institutional campaign of the company, is that there is no future without mining. And there can be no mining without caring about the future. Thank you. Uh, we have about 10 minutes uh, for my notes. I see that we have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. While uh, these microphones are being rounded up, uh, I'd like to entertain uh, the first questions for Fernando. Any questions? If there's no one yet who has formulated a question, I have a question for you. We have three projects that you have listed. Uh, I think many people here who are in the business of, of uh, looking for opportunities with mining companies uh, probably have in their minds the question, how far away is Vale from opening up a mine in the Philippines? Excellent question. I don't know. I don't know. Well, uh, when you work in exploration, well, you don't know, right? So in, in, at, at the early stage. So we need a few years to to to, well, to know better. Right? So historically, from a discovery to a mine takes 20 years. From a discovery to a mine, okay, putting all the commodities together, all the examples around the globe. So um, from exploration, I would say two years, four years, and go for. Pre-feasibility, two more years. Bankable feasibility. You know, depending how how easy is your project, you know, if it's too complex in terms of uh, community or metallurgy, engineering. You know. So we put two more years plus two more years of construction. So we're talking about if you find something tomorrow. If I drill there, I find an amazing intercept. We're talking about 12 years from now, 10, 12 years. Considering the counter is stable, long term, long term price, everything. So. Thank you. Any, any any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, Mike is coming. Uh, please uh, state your name and uh, affiliation. Hello, my name is Bruce Cohen. I work for a financial services group called Cab Alexander. Um, I'm just curious that all your exploration here is just based on copper. And um, can you explain what's the, my ignorance? What's the big deal about copper that you seem to be really keen on developing copper around the world? Thank you. Well, we like copper. Um, well, we see, see. I don't have any graphs here, but you see the the, the, the demand for copper. You know, uh, in China, for instance, you know, um, it's huge. You know. Copper, it's widely used, you know, so, well, you've seen this presentation now there because of copper, right? So for, for, uh, for 
cables and uh, electricity, energy, so all the wires. So we need copper, and so to grow, you know, to, to, to you know, in urban areas, you know, industrialization. So we need copper. So it's it is a, a key commodity. You no, know? thinking thinking on the grow, people need copper as well as concrete. You know, so start talking about cement. You need steel. You know, so for the steel, you, you need iron, little dose of nickel, so we can to to make it stainless steel. You know, so a little bit of manganese. You know, and other elements to make it harder, softer. So a lot of engineering behind. And then we have some large copper in a, in a deposits in Brazil, and the company. You know, the price is it's good, and we. Our long-term price, you know, the, 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 it's that we consider is you know, very interesting. So that's why we put in our portfolio the main business. Did I answer? Thank you. Uh, other, I I have to comment on copper. I, I several years ago heard uh, Robert Friedland uh, talk about uh, copper, and he called it the green metal. And then he puts on a photograph of a hybrid car. And he says, first year of production, the Toyota Hybrid, 200,000 cars, and blah, 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 now, two million cars. Now Germany is making cars. Now every, uh, everybody's making hybrid cars. He said, let me point out to you that the difference between a regular car and a hybrid car is several hundred. He said 500 pounds more of copper. So you could tell the uh, environmentalists, if we want to go hybrid, we still need copper. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'll name. My, I don't need to name myself. No, no. I, for those of, for those of you who are not miners here, I'm sure they'd like to know. I mean, you, you, Valet's got lots of money, but what is it? You know, if it's looking for a mine in the Philippines and it's looking for a major mine, okay, what is the minimum size it's looking for, and what will that minimum size require by way of investment to build that mine? Uh, in today's money? Okay, in terms of size, we, well, there's a, for those who know, there's a, a grade tonnage curve. Okay, so it's grade versus tonnage. So, the, the, the size could vary according to the grade. Okay, so we have a higher grade, we would be okay to a smaller you know, uh, deposit. But our idea is about 500 million tons at 1% copper equivalent. Okay, that's our target. Doesn't mean we cannot develop something at 400 at 0 0.7 or 400 at 0 0.6. You know, if you all understand what I'm saying. You know, um, there's other variables. You know, we have the target of 500 at 1% equivalent, a copper equivalent, but. If you have a, a little bit smaller, with a lower grade, but very easy to mine, you know metallurgical issues. You know, uh, also infrastructure half ready. You know, that's that's it's complicated. <laughs> Mining is it's, it's, well, it's a very interesting business and it's complicated. So, but basically, it's five uh, five hundred point uh, at one percent. We would like to go, you know, bigger. So if you think about Tempac and I don't know. <laughs> oh, for the, the only the, the Capex. Yeah. Uh, the cap, the Capex for a five. No, nah, well, look, take take, take uh, uh, Tempac as an example. So we're talking about two billion tons. You know, what is the grade there? 0.7. So, five five point two billion. I think it's higher. I think it's higher. So. I mentioned one fourth of that, so 500 million. You know, uh, I mean, you still need to put a, a mill. You know, Pampaco will have a larger mill or two lines. I don't know. So, two billion at least. Okay. Once you once you have everything uh, finalized. Okay. From now we're going to construct. So now it's two billion. But of course, you 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 spend. Few tens of millions in exploration and feasibility and bankability stuff. Fernando, um, you're saying 500 at one percent. What sort of uh, employment would you have on uh, in the construction phase, and then what would you have in production? Do you have any uh, idea on what sort of 
No. Employee levels? I, I forgot to what say. What would they range I, I, from? I forgot to say in the beginning, I'm a geologist. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if there any mining engineer can help me out. Um, I saw a presentation in, uh, in Tampakan. How many people they would need to, to build uh, like a, I don't know, the, the mine there. About 10,000? 30,000? I remember there was 1.5 tons of rice per day. So the logistics involved would be amazing to deliver that. So it's, uh, so. It's sizable it, it, though. Yeah. Thousands of people. Thousands of people. And if you believe that the dollar that's spent or peso that's spent in the mining project goes around at least six times, if there are 30,000 employees in the Tampakan project alone times six, 240,000, my, my math right, I'm a lawyer, 240,000 <laughs> jobs will be generated out of that investment. Am I correct? Okay, or something like that. Uh, I, was talk I was speaking about jobs and inflation, you know, I, inflation's everywhere and uh, just the other day I ordered a thousand peso steak at a restaurant and I said, put, please put it on my MasterCard. By golly, it fit. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Could you tell us what is the location? and perhaps more significantly, what are the criteria which uh, uh, convince Vale to put the port in Malaysia? Well, since it's public information, I think I can talk a little bit about that. Um, I don't remember the exact location, sorry, Paul. Um, I can get it to you, okay? But, I mean, I don't remember the name and how to pronounce it, so... Uh, but uh, the idea is uh, you bring the iron ore from Brazil, okay, and uh, well, we had the traders, right? Norwegian company, so I had the traders, you know. Vale has huge, uh, Brazil has huge reserves, and then also Australia, right? So the three ugly sisters for China uh, is uh, Vale, BHP, and Rio. So can we, we provide 90% of the market, if I'm not wrong, on iron. Okay, but Valley, uh, the the buyers pay a, a bonus, but like pay like a um, premium for Valley's ore because the grade and, and and the material. Okay, so the only disadvantage for us is the geography. Okay, so then Valley realized that started building our own vessels, but larger vessels. Okay, and of course, it would be much better to deliver straight to the client who they are. Mainly China, but Japan is also buying a lot of you know, iron ore. So China. So we tried. I think I'm not sure, but I'm, I don't get much involved in that. But of course, I hear, you know, in those workshops and so. And um, the idea, of course, was to build this port because there's no port to accommodate 400,000 tons uh, ship. You know, so we need to build that. And no one's going to build for you. You know, of course, you can make a joint venture so they can guarantee pre uh, supply for a particular client, one of the major steel makers in, in, in China. So we were trying to make to, to build in China and have a distribution center there. But it's not easy, you know. China nowadays, they buy the iron ore. The steel makers, they have their own distribution center and they resell to the smaller, okay, and, 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 and supply themselves. So if the spot market no, if the spot market price is higher than the contract, they sell by the spot market price. And when the spot market is below, so they sell by the contract price. So it was really hard, and then, but we need to put in place. So we had other alternatives where to build that. You know, so it is in, is in the route, you know, from Brazil. You know. And I believe, I, I don't get involved, but I believe Vale talked to many countries around that, around the, the, the region, you know. Got some. At the end of the day, is you no. Know, on the paper, how much it's going to cost? You no, know, taxes and everything. So, and now maybe also interaction between the both countries, the two countries involved, Brazil and the country where Valley would build that that port. Okay, and then we had to do it. Had to do it. Said okay, China. I don't think. I mean, I'm. 
guessing. Oh, well, we don't think China's going to happen soon. Let's put in. So, of course, there will be a cost with the double handling, right? But I think the company is still, you know, think it's profitable and, you know, so it's okay. Just to bring the power on, the land that I confess to my early involvement in this issue, um, on behalf of Bale, I would have to do some investigation on the period in the port site in uh, northern Mindanao uh, and the um, water depth of the water is very favourable at the period there. There were some issues there with availability of the fishing area. Um, and I lost track of that. So I do know that Bali looked at a number of countries around the region. I believe for a little bit intrigued as to why Malaysia, as opposed to the alternative side of the city, or some other major countries, and obviously, the north shore area will be strategic in my you know, and uh, believe me, you know, if if there was any research, you know, I mean, if someone came in here, and, and probably the, this department, they don't, they don't even know that I exist, you know, and that I'm in the country. So it's, you know, it's a big company. <laughs> yes. Uh, Alan Blackley from uh, QED. Fernando, I promised I'd be, go easy on you today, but nobody's actually put you on the spot yet. Um, so I guess it's left up to me. <clears throat> I'm not too sure it's a good idea to put your clients on the spot, but I'll do so. Try me. Um, we all understand that the Philippines, uh, prospectivity-wise for copper and gold, is a great place to be. But from your point of view in exploration, and I am putting you on the spot, what would you see would be the, your greatest challenges uh, in getting your projects up and running here in the Philippines? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, definitely, you know, that's, that's why we're here. Okay, so we see uh, Anglo has pulled out. Well, Rod's still around. He's not here today. No. So, but Anglo is pulling out. BGP is not here. We have Extrata, it is. You know, but it's uh, in, in a Tampakan project. So, and Valley, you know, two years ago just come in. So, we think the company didn't think about it. You know, and consider. All the you know the, the the circumstance in the country. Yes, definitely, it's it's a great place to be. You now it's a small island, a lot of porphyry, so a lot of potential for copper and gold porphyries. And for me, the key for success in the Philippines, it's community relations. You know, the resources are there, the potential is there. You now it's how uh, how we get access to the ground. You know, so. We can learn, you know, previous histories. You can read about it, talk to people, so we see how how did you go wrong, you know, what did you do, or well, what it didn't do, okay? And uh, things had to change. If you have the same the good old strategy, you're going to have the same good old result, failure, right? So we need be innovative, you know. It doesn't mean like you need to put two billions in the community in exploration. I'm talking about that. I'm talking about transparency. I'm talking about early engagement, you know, and and then uh, yeah, it's hard, uh, but we need to continue. So it's engaging, transparency, communication, you know, that's my view. I now have one last question for the for you people to ask. I have run out, so uh, one last question before we uh, we have uh, give Fernando a second beer. Uh, my name's Mark Higgins from Steelcore Homes. Uh, it's a uh, Question going back towards uh, Bruce Curran, really, about the copper. Uh, we were just talking over coffee this morning about basically 20 years, you were saying, that it takes from looking at a site to actually mining and the rising price in copper. Basically, in 20 years, how do you see copper against gold? Because I'm led to believe already countries are starting to reserve copper and it will be used probably more in the futures uh, as a better guide against gold? It's a good question. I mean, uh, I'm a geologist. <laughs> That's why I'm asking you the question. No, yeah, definitely, definitely, you know, definitely. I think of, well, any, everybody could, you know, uh, think about that, you know. Um, I think the strategy of the company, you know, in getting to copper is also that line, you know, 
having uh, copper reserves, copper resources rather than gold. Vale is not a gold miner. We have mined gold in the past, but we're not into gold, you know. And uh, other other point is important. Gold is much higher investment, you know. It's a much higher investment. You know? You know, copper is much lower. And um, definitely, if you see the the graphs for gold and for copper, you know, in the last 20 years, you know, I just saw the, the graph this morning and the copper. You know, it's I put it back on 10 years ago it was two thousand dollars a ton, and now it's today it was what ten thousand. You know, and it's still growing. And uh, gold was still two thousand a pound uh, six months ago. I'm not falling gold much, but today it was at one five, one thousand five hundred a ton. So hey, it's a good, it's a, it's a good thought. I mean, I don't have the the, the, the full answer for you, but it's uh, definitely. You know.